What's going on everybody? My name is Mark and welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. If you clicked on this video then you are watching part two of a three-part series that I decided to create which topics cover making a Boba Fett helmet. From 3D printing in part one to resin casting in part two Part 3 will consist of painting both the 3D printed and the resin casted copies of these helmets with both the paint job from Return of the Jedi and the paint job from The Mandalorian or now most recently Book of Boba Fett. If you're just coming into this having not seen Part 1, I do highly recommend that you go check that out, especially if the method by which you're wanting to make a Boba Fett helmet involves 3D printing. Now shifting focus onto this video, I'll go ahead and provide a brief explanation of what I'm doing in this first clip. The EVA foam skirt that I'm gluing 5 inches past the bottom of the helmet is for the purposes of mess prevention that are faced later on in the casting process. Essentially, the extra space that is extending past the bottom section of this helmet will prevent any resin from spilling out of the inside of the mold. After resin is poured into the mold, slush casting involves rotating the mold on both its X and Y axis in order to create a hollow representation of what the mold is shaped like. Personally, I'll go ahead and just give a thumbs up to the idea of not spilling polyurethane resin all over my clothes. When you glue the EVA foam to itself and to the inside of the helmet, there are going to be seams that will need to be filled in. To accomplish this, I used an air drying spot putty. The reason for that is because it takes about 15 to 30 minutes to dry, and it also is easy to sand off any excess that you don't want. In regard to what you should use to sand off the excess, I wouldn't use anything exceptionally coarse. 320 grit sandpaper should be sufficient. Now to kick off the silicone portion of this project, we start by brushing on the detail coat. This layer will determine how accurately the mold captures the model. For this coat, you'll want to apply a modest amount of silicone and also be sure to brush gently. While doing this, the silicone will want to run off of your model. You'll have to catch the bits of silicone that run off and reapply them to the model. As the silicone begins to cure, the drips will become less frequent. When applying your second coat of silicone, you can be a little bit more generous with how much material you're using because the second layer should be thicker than the first. Also, given that you're using more material, you may find it easier to use a spatula-like device rather than a brush to apply the silicone. While you're waiting for your second coat to at least partially cure, meaning it's no longer tacky and dry to the touch, you can go ahead and start making registration keys. The only two ways that I know of that you can make these keys are either A, using scrap silicone that you had sitting around from another project, or B, you could pour unused silicone into something like a mixing palette for acrylic paint. The cavities inside of one of these are round and registration keys need to be rounded to be able to easily fit into the outer support shell or more commonly referred to as a mother mold. To provide a little bit of information on what a mother mold actually is, a mother mold is typically an outer rigid shell that supports the flexible rubber mold that is helping it retain its shape during the casting process. Later on in the video, I'll demonstrate how this mother mold is actually made. But for now, the main thing to focus on is getting these registration keys to adhere to the outside surface area of the mold that we've made so far. Now to accomplish this, my favorite product of choice would be Silpoxy, which is produced by SmoothOn. Silpoxy is a one component adhesive that's made specifically for bonding RTV, mold making silicone rubbers to silicone rubber and other substrates including urethane plastics, plasters, ceramics, and fabrics. To wrap up the silicone portion of this project, all I'm doing is going back over this mold with additional coats of silicone until I've achieved at least 3 eighths to 1 half of an inch thickness. Now I know it's not shown in the footage, but another way that you could also speed this process up is by using a thickening agent for your silicone that is called Thyvex. This is also produced by SmoothOn. Thyvex is made especially for thickening silicones for vertical surface application. Different viscosities can be attained by varying amounts of Thyvex. Now anytime that I've ever used Thyvex, I've never really measured it out properly. I've kind of just eyeballed it until I got the consistency that I wanted. The consistency that you should try to achieve if you're going to use a thickening agent like Thyvex is reminiscent of cake icing, so do keep that in mind if you decide to use it. 
If you still end up with thin spots on your mold, you can use automotive grade RTV silicone to cover up those spots. It may not look pretty, but it will get the job done. This next part of the video is one that I particularly enjoy, and that is tracing the contour of the silicone jacket. The process for this is actually quite simple. In order to do this, I use playing cards. I layer them one by one from one side of the mold to the other, as shown in the footage, and I tape them together with painter's tape, as that is not destructive, and then I can just stick these back in the box after I'm done using them. But essentially what I'm trying to do is create a spine that has the contour of the outside of the helmet that I can later trace on to plywood. And for your convenience, here's a close-up of exactly what I'm talking about. Once that's been completed, then we can start working on the framing for our mother mold. For this, to start, you will need two sheets of plywood that are of equal size and thickness. Then take the template that you made earlier, tape that onto the plywood, and trace it with a sharpie. To hold both sheets of plywood together, you can use bolts and wing nuts. Once both sheets of plywood are bolted together and then you've clamped it down, go ahead and break out a jigsaw and then cut out the contour that you traced earlier. The next clip that's coming up is one that I think is something that's based on personal preference. But essentially, what I did was take a spade bit and cut off two holes adjacent from each other on both sides and then cut off the additional space with my jigsaw. The way I see it is that with a mother mold and the silicone jacket inserted with the casting resin that will later be poured into that mold will end up being anywhere from 25 to 30 pounds. So naturally, having handles on the sides of my mother mold makes sense. Applying plaster bandage is something that's quite simple as it activates with warm water and then you have around 7 to 10 minutes before it completely dries. For any viewers that have experience with making these molds, I know I just probably raised your eyebrow by showing you a can of Flex Seal. Please let me explain. I understand that normally you would want to use something like fiberglass resin to cover the outside of the mold in order to protect the plaster bandage. However, if sprayed thick enough, Flex Seal really doesn't flex as much as you think it would. Also, if I had to compare the two, I would say that Flex Seal doesn't smell nearly as bad as fiberglass resin. It may put off a smell when you discharge it from the can, but roughly 24 hours later it has virtually no smell at all. I wish I could say the same thing about fiberglass resin. Another thing that I want to address with this is the possibility that the Flex Seal could leak through the plaster bandage and then bond with the mold. So yes, that has happened to me, and it does make demolding a pain in the ass. However, if you are thorough enough and make sure that there aren't any areas where the Flex Seal could seep into, you should be fine. Once both sides of this mother mold have been removed, then we'll want to protect the inside of the mother mold as well, as the plaster bandage is still exposed. If you're wanting to use a material that is more rigid and non-toxic, I recommend that you use tight bond, or really any wood glue is fine. Only apply up to two coats and make sure that you spread this thinly, as you do not want to distort the inside of the mother mold. Now before I get into resin casting, I did want to provide a close-up of the inside of the silicone mold as it sits in the mother mold. Notice how the silicone jacket is still retaining its shape thanks to the hard outer shell that it's sitting inside of. This is something that I simply found fascinating and I thought you guys might want to see it as well. The type of resin that I'm using is called polyurethane casting resin. The company that I bought it from is called Specialty Resin and Chemical. As always, links in the description below. Through the process of trial and error, I've found out that for a mold of this size, you should probably use roughly 100 milliliters of resin at a time. Too much resin at once will not spread thinly enough and you'll end up with areas of your cast that are way thicker than they're supposed to be. Essentially, the casting resin would cure faster than you could spread it. While the demold time for polyurethane casting resin is 15 to 30 minutes, the working time is only two to two and a half minutes, so you do have to work quickly. As far as the thickness of your model goes, you should aim for about a quarter inch thickness, which means you'll probably end up using six to seven hundred milliliters of casting resin. And we've arrived at the part of the video which is my personal favorite, demolding the cast. If you sprayed mold release into your mold prior to casting, you should have a pretty easy time getting this to come out. As you peel back the silicone jacket, you can go ahead and start breaking off any additional excess flash that made its way outside of the shape of the helmet during casting. Also make note of how much excess flash I ended up with. 
This is just a further reiteration of what I was talking about at the beginning of the video when I made an EVA foam skirt that extended 5 inches past the bottom section of the helmet. The reason why I like this part of the video the most is because there is quite a bit of effort that goes into making a slush cast mold. And finally, we're to a point where we have a product in hand. Now, if that is not a perfect example of a dopamine fix, then I don't know what is. To begin processing this cast, the first thing that I did was start removing the visor cutout. To accomplish this, I used a pair of sprue cutters. That's not exactly the best tool to use for this because polyurethane casting resin does crack pretty easily. If you can help it, I would recommend using some sort of rotary tool to accomplish this. A cutting wheel on a Dremel should be sufficient. In this case, since I didn't use a rotary tool to remove the visor cutout, I followed up behind the areas that I cut with the sprue cutters with an X-Acto knife. I cut everything as evenly as I possibly could with the X-Acto knife and then I followed up with 80 grit sandpaper. I only lightly scuffed along the areas where the visor cutout used to be, then I moved on to scuffing the inside of the helmet where the tinted visor will later on be installed. Also as a reminder guys, this is something that I did cover in part 1 of making a Boba Fett helmet. By scuffing, what you're essentially doing is giving the adhesive that you'll apply later something to grip onto. Since this helmet will inevitably be painted in part 3, I went ahead and applied a primer coat. Also by applying a primer coat, it's going to help me identify any imperfections that I can sand away with 320 grit sandpaper. If I failed to mention this earlier, I will go ahead and mention it now. By no means is any resin cast absolutely perfect and neither are the molds that they are conceived in. And not one resin cast is exactly the same as the other, so there's always going to be sanding involved. Now, after you've sanded this helmet to your liking, you can go ahead and hit it with a second coat of primer. Just be sure to spray lightly on this coat as you don't want to distort your model. And while that dries, go ahead and get started on cutting out a T-shaped visor for the helmet. If anybody needs any guidance on how to make a T-shaped visor, this is something that I covered in part 1 of making a Boba Fett helmet. And for your convenience, for those who are interested, I have provided the link in the description below. If you're new to my channel, one of the things that I try to make a point of doing every single video is providing you with every material that I used in the process of whatever it is that I was making that week. I understand that for some viewers, these videos may only serve as a form of entertainment. However, for the demographic of users that want to try and use these videos as a tutorial, my goal is to empower you guys to get out there, make some kick props, and then show it off to your friends, family, and fellow cosplayers. Alternately, on the entertainment side of things, if you guys want to see me make a certain helmet or a certain prop from a video game movie or TV show, let me know in the comments section below and I'll be more than happy to try and take a detour and make that prop for you. Now moving on, my on-screen self should be finished up with cutting out that T-Visor. Now my method for installing a T-Visor is kind of interesting. I start off with a gel super glue and an accelerator so I can tack the visor into place quickly. I make sure that I have at least 5 points of contact. I then follow up with a hot glue gun and essentially what I'm doing here is filling any empty space between the inside of the helmet and the visor. The reason for this is because the final adhesive that I use in this process is 5 minute epoxy. Let's say hypothetically I were to skip the hot glue step. What would happen is when I apply the 5 minute epoxy, anything that's on the inside of the helmet is going to leak through those voids and end up on the outside of the helmet. Once the 5 minute epoxy starts tacking up, pull your tape and don't wait until it completely hardens. And that pretty much concludes my process for resin casting a Boba Fett helmet. Also, keep in mind that this is only part 2 of a 3 part series. In part 3, I will be trying to replicate the Return of the Jedi paint job and the Book of Boba Fett paint job for the two helmets that I've made so far. And just for fun, let's test everybody's memory. Based on the thumbnail that you clicked on, do you remember which helmet was resin casted and which helmet was 3D printed? Alright, well whether you got that correct or not, let me know in the comment section below, and also feel free to let me know what you liked or did not like about this video, as I am open to both constructive and destructive criticism. But most importantly of all, if you guys truly enjoyed the video, hit the like button, hit that subscribe button, and then hit the notification bell so you'll be notified when I publish new content. I hope to see everybody again here next time, and as always, 
Thanks for watching.